So this meeting will be recorded um, so that anybody who's not managed to join us today can uh, come back and watch it later. Or indeed, anybody who has joined us today can come back and watch it all over again, because I'm sure there's going to be a lot of very, very interesting talks. Um, just a little bit of internet protocol. If I could ask you to keep yourselves <laughs> muted, um, unless you are um, speaking. Um, by all means, please keep your cameras turned on because we love to see people's faces. And um, there will be a chance for everybody to, to ask questions. We'll see how the talks go. We hope to have the talks around about 20 minutes because there's quite a few to get through. So if you have got burning questions at the end of a talk, um, either note them down. If we're a little bit tight on time, we'll come back to them at the end. Or if there's a little bit of time, raise your hand use the raise hand function in the reactions, and um, we'll see if we can tackle them as they come up. Um, so just let a few more people in and get some people muted. There we go. Um, so first of all, a, a really warm welcome to this truly international meeting. Um, I'd like to say a very early good morning to Chitlali in Mexico <laughs> and a good evening to colleagues in China and a good afternoon to everybody who's joining us from either Wales, the UK or Europe. So um, we've got presentations from all over the world and I know we've got people joining us from, from various places. So a very warm welcome to, to all of you. Um, I'm really pleased that we've got this opportunity um, to share our research. This isn't a formal conference as such, uh, and sadly that wasn't able to take place, but I know there is so much good research work going on in China, around the world in various places, as well as our own research um, that we've been doing. And this was such a good opportunity for us to find out what other colleagues are researching. There are many different forms of Qigong. There are many different forms of extending that practice into research. And this is a great opportunity for us to share that. And maybe to, after this conference, to pool resources or to share ideas about research going forward. Um, uh, just a couple of people I'd like to mention. I'm not sure that um, Nick Campion has joined us yet but I know he was trying to. So Nick Campion is um, the director of the Harmony Institute at the University of Wales, Trinity St. David. And I know he takes a particular interest uh, in some of our work with our Chinese colleagues. So um, if he joins us a bit later, welcome to Nick. Also a very warm welcome to uh, colleagues from our partner university, BUU. Uh, I'm not sure if Lisa, my uh, Chinese co-director is here. Um, Lisa Liu, but uh, welcome to Lisa. I also think that uh, we may be joined by uh, some professors from BUU, Professor Liu Fun, who is from the Special Education College, so a warm welcome, and possibly Professor Liu Dongming, so a warm welcome there as well. So um, I think without any further ado, I would like to invite my colleague Peter, um, to give us his presentation. Many of you already know Peter. Um, he is our, our very much um, valued and dear teacher, co-teacher for our Saturday classes with Zhang Yan, and uh, recently led our sleep improving Qigong course for two weeks. Uh, so I know he's quite well known to many of you. Some of you may also know Peter from his travels over many years. He's a very experienced Qigong teacher who spent maybe about 10 years uh, teaching in Europe and other countries um, and is now uh, a master's student at Jiangxi University of Chinese Medicine. So a warm welcome, Peter. I will mute myself and ask you to give us your presentation. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Chris. Thank you, everyone. Okay, can you uh, see my presentation? Yes, can see it perfectly. Okay, great. Okay, great. Okay, so today our topic is about the Qigong research. 
So as all of us know, Qigong comes from China. So in today's presentation, I will shortly introduce the general situation uh, of Qigong in China, especially about the academic research. So I am from the Jiangxi University of Chinese Medicine. Firstly, we need to know what is Qigong. Most of us know it, but uh, maybe not so accurately. As Chris said, we have many kinds of Qigong. They have a different movement. They even have a different theory. So what's the common? Yeah, what's the common characteristic of all the different Qigong is very important for us to know it. Firstly, the theory. The theory of Qigong based on the viewpoint of holistic life. Here, holistic life means in Qigong, we, we think our life has the connection with nature. It's one, we can say it's one with nature, with space. Also, our life is one with society, with the world, with our world. Also, our life, our body, our body, our chi, our mind is also holistic unity. So this is a viewpoint. This is a very important for understanding chi. And the method, so Qigong, we have the practice. We have many methods, but the common, the common characteristic is to use inward thinking for practice. Here inward thinking is compared with our daily thinking, our daily mind, our daily mind Almost all of our attention is outside. We focus on our job, our housework, and everything. Nearly everything is we focus outside. But during Qigong practice, we need to draw our attention back to sense, to observe our body, our body movement, or our chi flowing, our chi change inside. Even we can observe our mental, our thought, how our thought can into being, how our emotion rise, and how it disappear. So this kind of thinking, or we can say this kind of meditation is belongs to Qigong. Yeah, Qigong, we come back to our life. Here life, including our body movement, our Qi, our thought, our consciousness. And the purpose of Qigong is to transform perfect and improve the life functions of a human being and transform natural in instinct, instinct into conscious intelligence. So the purpose is to make our life better and better, to improve it, to free ourselves, free our life from suffering, to have freedom, to total freedom. And uh, here I inter explain a little about the natural instinct into consciousness intelligence. For example, the natural instinct, we as a human being, we easily to have emotion. We follow the emotion. If we are controlled by emotion, then we are naturally. This is the natural 
instinct. Then if we can improve ourselves, improve ourselves, especially our mental state to a higher level, then we can be the master of our thought, our emotion. We can be the master of our whole life. Then it means conscious, conscious intelligence. So conscious intelligence here means we, are, we enter into a free state, a enlightenment state. We, we are free from suffering, from the physical problem or mental problem. So this is achieving our purpose. Then introduce the history. The history of Qigong very long time, very long history. Qigong can trace back to 3000 BC according to a pottery found in Qinghai province. Qinghai province is nearby Tibet. On, on a pottery, there is a picture showing a man doing the standing meditation. So it's, it has a very long history. And this photo, this photo is a jet. You can watch the collector, Chinese collector on it. It has the history of two, 2000 and uh, about 400 years, 2,400 years. This was describe a cheap method. Okay, this one. So we know Qigong has a very long history. We have many things like this, like this jet to testify its history. And the also, we have, with the long history, we have many different categories of Qigong, including especially Buddhist, Taoist, Confucian, martial arts, traditional Chinese medicine, and so on. Yeah, just several main groups. Then each group, it, can, it also has many branches many different schools of Qigong. In China, in the record, record, there are nearly more than 1,000 different schools of Qigong. And the amount of Qigong practitioner is at least, yeah, this is at least more, more than 100, uh, 10 million in China, 10 million practitioner. Okay, this is one photo to show in one kind of Qigong. And uh, now I will especially introduce the Qigong ac academic research in China. There are many Qigong papers in CNKI, uh, KI, yeah, very famous data da database in China, Wang Fang and the uh, VIP data pair, uh, database, which are very famous in China. And uh, this time I choose the data in CNKI for showing the Qigong research in China, because it uh, has so many papers that can show the general research situation. It's uh, very typical. So when I search the data, I use the Chinese word qigong, yeah, not English, Chinese word qigong for searching for the paper title in CNKI. Uh, KI. We have found 4,482 paper on journals and uh, 471 academic this uh, dissertation of a PhD or master degree till uh, April 13th, 2023. This picture shows the 
each year the quantity of paper. So we can see the is wave, yeah, it's change every year. And uh, this year, 2023, we still to upload. So it's a, a bit of a lower uh, quantity. And uh, the many chicken paper on the journals are related, are related to solving different health problems. This is one of the main topic of Qigong. And this photo shows the, the section, the keywords. Yeah, the keywords connected with our section, Qigong. Number one is health Qigong. Yeah, health Qigong, we have the official association in China. And the, our government put a lot of effort for teaching it. That's why it has much research paper on it also. The second, Qigong, yeah, only Qigong. The third is eight section blocket. It's also called Ba Duan Jin. Eight section blocket is also a kind of a health Qigong. Yeah, so from the first three, we know health Qigong has done, been done many research on it. The number four is a Qigong exercise. Number five is a Qigong therapy. Number six is a Qigong science. Okay. Then, then, we, then we go to next. And the research paper has uh, been divided into different subjects, yeah, different uh, schools of science. You see the biggest part is a TCM. So most of the paper has a connection with the traditional Chinese medicine, about 45%. Then the second is about sports. Because the movement, the movement has many, if we look from the outside, is much similar as sports. And the, the third is about the mental, psychiatric. Okay, now we go next. And this photo shows the author, yeah, which author issue the most paper. Here I introduce my supervisor. He, Professor Zhang Wenchun, he, his paper is number four, the quantity has already 25. We can search 25 in this uh, database. In fact, in fact, uh, the real quantity is a bit more. And uh, this photo shows the research are supported or funded by which organization? The number one is the National Natural Science Foundation of China. So the Qigong research supported by this. And this is uh, this foundation is the, is the one of the most important foundation for scientific research in China. And the second is, uh, it is National Social Science Fund of China. It's also one of the most important foundation in China for their research. And the third is uh, from Shanghai. It's Shanghai important, uh, important the science subjects, uh, construction, construction subject. And uh, about the health, 
I have searched for the popular topics among the 4,482 paper. Hypertension. Till now, I thought hypertension has the most. 88 paper is about it. Then you can see diabetes. We have 37. And uh, here I must say almost uh, nearly all of the paper, this, uh, this I list, what I list, the result is uh, positive. Yeah, so it means it has effect, has the real effect on this disease. The third is mental health, 32 paper, and the immune, immune function. Then is the insomnia or sleep quality. So we already have 23 paper about it. Also, we have the inflammation. Here, inflammation is about like uh, the slowed inflammation, the prostate uh, inflammation, or the joints inflammation. So different inf inflammation. Also, we have the cervical spon spondinosis, tensor. We have a 10 paper and also depression, stroke. Here also, some of us have interest in Parkinson. We also have a seven paper research about it. And also for Qigong, the aged people, yeah, have 47 paper. So the research, Qigong research on the aged people is a very popular topic. And also in China, most practitioners of Qigong are aged people. So from this, we can say the Qigong research is very prom promising. And uh, when we have a good cooperation, we can do many important Qigong research together, it's, uh, especially in the area of solving complicated health problems. Here, I must stress, I must stress uh, the Qigong in our university. Our university, Jiangxi University of uh, Chinese medicine, our Qigong has combined many different schools of Qigong, such as Buddhism, Taoism, martial arts, TCM. And also, we respect a lot on science, modern science. So we also combine modern science. And uh, that's why our Qigong has been the Qigong, TCM Qigong on the test, text book for universities of China, the TCM universities. So, and uh, in the 1990s, we already did a lot of research. More than 100 diseases, we have research on it with our Qigong and it shows magnificent, significant effect. So we have much confidence in today, in the more advanced science, scientific society, we can do the similar research with our Qigong intervention on those problems. Yeah, on those disease. And uh, I'm sure most of them, we can have the significant result. So, and uh, so we also hope we can cooperate together because I'm, as I am find, the Western thinking is also very important for the Qigong research because we have from the different uh, Culture background. And when we match together, we can make the research more 
we can design the research better and uh, more follow combined with the requirements of modern science and to have the more inform more formal scientific result. Okay, and uh, thank you for your listening. This is my email and the uh, telephone, and also I have uh, the Facebook. Okay, so looking forward to communicate with you more. And thank you for Chris uh, giving the chance. Thank you, everyone. Peter, thank you so much for that talk. I think um, I mean, there's several things that really struck me about that. The amount of research that's been going on for several decades in China. Secondly, how little we know about it here in the West. <laughs> so this is something that we really do need to put right. And maybe this meeting is one small step towards that. Um, but also the kind of research that um, Jiangxi University has been doing and the importance of, of science in that, because I think this is one of the, the biggest issues uh, for Qigong in the West, is that it's not considered to be uh, something that can be precisely measured, something that is quite elusive to capture in scientific terms, and yet the work that you're doing in Jiangxi is showing that actually it is possible. And indeed, some of the research that we've been doing together, I hope is also pointing in that direction. So thank you, that, that was a, a really insightful presentation. Um, what I would, um, because I'm conscious of time, so I think if anybody has got burning questions, please note them down. We will come back to people's questions um, at the end. So um, what I'd like to move on to next is the research um, that our Confucius Institute has been doing in partnership with Jansi University and with Northumbria University Wellbeing Informatics team. Um, Thanks to, to Petya and her team, well, that team, I should mention straight away, consists of, of Petya Seiss, of um, Zeynep, um, Zeynep Turgut, um, sorry, Zeynep Kurt, Gary Elvin, Susie Ogwu, and Sevgi Turgut. And um, also, very importantly, that research was made possible because Professor Zhang very kindly made his lung strengthening Qigong exercise available, taught by Zhao Zhang Yan. And as a result of the, the couple of years of doing that practice and doing that research, we've, we've been able to make some quite important steps in showing the efficacy of that research. Um, so a really big thank you to, to Jansi for that. I'm going to share my screen and I am going to play the video for you. So hopefully you can all see my screen. And here we go. And thank you to uh, Zeynep's team for putting this presentation together. During eight weeks in spring 2021, at the height of the COVID pandemic, an international team from the Confucius Institute at the University of Wales, Trinity St. David, Jiangxi University of Chinese Medicine and Northumbria University carried out a research program into the effects of the lung strengthening Qigong exercise on the mental, emotional, and physical well being of a group of participants. As well as assessing any immediate benefits, the research also sought to understand the experiences of the participants in the context of a Chinese medicine model of well being. The research project emerged following the initial promising results of a previous smaller study into this form of Qigong exercise published by SAIS in 2020. The results of this larger study, now published in the peer-reviewed journal Complementary Therapies in Medicine, show that 84% of participants in the study experienced an improvement in well-being. The positive effects of the lung strengthening Qigong exercise included improvements in mental, physical, and relational well-being. The rest of this presentation will go into more detail about the structure, methodology, and results of this exciting research project.
The Lung Strengthening Qigong Exercise was designed by Professor Zhang Wenchun of Jiangxi University of Chinese Medicine. The exercise was used to good effect among hospital staff and patients in China to boost the immune system and foster overall health and resilience during the pandemic. Following the principles of Chinese medicine, the exercise aims to improve the flow of qi energy between the lungs and kidneys and to balance the state of mind, body and qi. PhD student Zhang Zhanyan from Jiangxi University, seen here in the photograph, delivered the weekly online lung strengthening Qigong practice to the group and gave talks on the principles of Chinese medicine that provide the theoretical framework for the exercise. Recordings of each section, together with a detailed handbook, were made available by Jiangxi University and were accessible by the participants via a link in an online diary, also used for data collection and recording of their experiences. The online diary, incorporating a baseline questionnaire and final self-evaluation questionnaire, were designed and created by the team at Northumbria University. An integrative model of well-being was considered suitable for this study. Although it was developed from a Western science perspective, the model has parallels with the traditional Chinese medicine model of the unity of body, mind, and qi. The model proposes a holistic perspective of a human system as a network of processes producing the global attributes of body, mind, and awareness in continuous interactions with the environment. At the same time, these attributes constrain and govern the internal dynamics of the processes that have produced them. In this sense, the human system exhibits self-organizing behavior. Awareness, mind, body, and environment are involved in the formation of perception. Living systems are open systems. Energy is added and given off at every point, and no part is in stable equilibrium. Energy fields permit our being, nature, and the universe. Mind well being is a harmonious and energized function of the human system and its components body, mind, awareness, interactions with the environment. The moon is functioning displays both stability and flexibility. From a physical point of view, the dance between flexibility and stability is choreographed by the dissipation of energy through a self-organizing living system, where each unit of the system keeps its independence and at the same time, has all the possibility for cooperation with others. The model and definition of well being inform our approach to measurement and interpretation. The model of well being requires an integrated approach to baseline measurements to include perception of body, mind, awareness, and interactions with the environment, as well as perception of an overall well-being state. When evaluating changes in response to the Qigong practice, we look for and monitor individual variables, as well as emergent patterns of what the person as an indivisible system experiences over time. Self-evaluation data collection tools were developed requesting completion of a baseline questionnaire at the beginning, middle, and end of the study, a daily online diary, and an end of study survey. We conducted an eight week of study in which we recruited 150 uh, lung strengthening Qigong or LSQ practitioners and 42 
uh, non-practitioner samples to investigate the impact of LSU on body, mind, thoughts, and feelings. We requested completion of a questionnaire uh, from both of the practitioners and also the control group. And uh, we requested uh, uh, from the practitioners to fill in an online diary and end of study survey. And uh, we conducted statistical analysis on the questionnaires, Bezan questionnaire and end of study survey. Uh, meanwhile, we applied qualitative analysis as well as a uh, machine learning based uh, natural language processing analysis on the online diary uh, entries. Before we started analyzing the questionnaire data as well as the online diary entries, we first investigated the distribution of demographics of our participants in terms of their age, gender, previous experience level with Qigong, etc. The predominant uh, demographic of participants was white female aged between 45 and 74. The largest number of participants had little or no previous experience of Qigong or Tai Chi or similar practices. Uh, still, uh, there was a group of practitioners who had some experience with uh, Tai Chi, uh, but uh, none had specific knowledge of uh, the traditional Chinese medicine Qigong, PCM Qigong. In the first stage of our integrative analysis, uh, we combined the questionnaire items which are scored between 1 and 100, which corresponds to the well-being related questions. And uh, then we also combined the health conditions related uh, questionnaire items, uh, which are scored between one uh, to four. Basically, in the well-being related items, uh, while the score gets closer to 100 or while the score uh, increased, uh, the condition uh, of the pr uh, practitioner get worse. So lower scores in the first uh, batch of questions means a better uh, well-being condition. We conducted our uh, baseline questionnaire at three different time points. And uh, the, in the initial uh, week or initial time point, in the midpoint of the study, which, it, which corresponds to the fourth and fifth week of the study, and at the end point, which corresponds to the eighth week of the study. Uh, basically, we observed a score decrease of uh, well-being related questions of the Qigong practitioners. Again, the decrease here need, uh, needs to be interpreted as an improvement in their well-being. Meanwhile, the control group, uh, which corresponds to the participants uh, who uh, do not practice Qigong, in the same questionnaire based on questionnaire uh, with the practitioners. Uh, while practitioners have statistically significant score change, uh, which reflects the improvement in time, the control groups have, uh, has no significant change. In terms of the, uh, the health conditions related items, which are scored between one to four, which is reflected in panels B and B, uh, there is not uh, a, a significant change observed still for the practitioners. There is a trend uh, uh, in change of the scores across time. Uh, meanwhile, again, for control group, there is no statistical significant change observed. After integrative analysis of two sets of questionnaire items, we individually analyzed the items which are scaled between 1 and 100. And we observed a statistically significant improvement over time in the practitioner group for most of the items related to physical well-being, such as general health, energy, balance, and better undisturbed sleep. 
And also we observed uh, an improvement in mental well-being related items such as uh, emotional life, coping with life, positive feeling towards life, connection to others, life energy, and a decrease in levels of stress. Uh, those items were uh, uh, reflecting a statistically significant improvement or in other words, uh, score uh, decrease in time. Uh, we also observed a, a statistically uh, significant decrease in uh, health conditions related uh, questions which will be upcoming. In the individual analysis of the questions scaled between one and four, there is no statistically significant change observed in the practitioner group yet. There is an obvious trend of improvement in almost all items, including muscle pain, joint pain, digestive problems, and headaches and fatigue. After statistical analysis of the baseline questionnaires, we analyzed the online diary entries filled in by the practitioners. The diary fields uh, consist of different dimensions of integrative well-being model, including the body awareness, focused attention, chi energy awareness, relational awareness, and satisfaction and meaning. Uh, we observed that uh, four different types of patterns emerged uh, across the practitioners. Uh, based on the diary entries. So those uh, four clusters represent four distinct level of benefits from LSQ practice. Uh, we labeled them as no change, low level, moderate level, and high level of change. Each cluster is driven by a particular set of sentiments or group of uh, vocabulary, and they reflect a unique type of LSQ journey. And the first cluster, which corresponds to the no change group, uh, terms such as tension, tiredness, and change uh, And in the second cluster, uh, which corresponds to the low level of change uh, or improvement, we observe such as calm improvement concentration. Whereas in the third cluster, which corresponds to the moderate level of change, we observe terms such as feel and in the last cluster, which uh, uh, is re representing the high level of change group, we observed extensively observed uh, words such as connected, warm, better. I felt dizzy after about 10 minutes. I opened my eyes and the dizziness disappeared. I suffer from frequent headaches and tension in my neck. To my surprise, the muscles in that area felt much more relaxed afterwards. I felt very good after doing this practice, especially the shoulder rotations. My neck and shoulders are always very tight because of tension and I get a lot of headaches. These are improving. Breathing is continuing to feel easier and more relaxed. I felt a sensation of physical well-being, less stiffness and more flexible. I feel my breath is deeper and its pace is reduced. I was able to detach from thoughts and let them flow without paying too much attention to them. I was able to visualize it seems to improve with practice. I had a headache before starting and it seems to have reduced. I feel a state of calm and serenity. Full practice. Felt connection to body as a whole. Noticed a sense of instability in my knees. This often happens as I begin to practice. I have arthritis which affects my knees. Initially the sense of instability affects my balance and I find that this feeling subsides as I complete the body scan and my balance steadies. My body settles into the exercise and my knees feel stronger.
I felt a very different body, seemed electrified. The forefinger of the right hand was very strange and pulsed much more than the others in such a way that it almost gave the sensation of having a channel in the finger. I felt my hands a lot softer today than on other days. I also found it strange that today I hardly ever saw the shades of lilacs, but everything was white. They look like white clouds, always changing shape. The practice gives me a feeling of well-being and tranquility. Usually, in guided meditation activities, I don't relax before. On the contrary, if a lot of information is given to me when I'm still, I feel very uneasy. I was told that this sometimes happens to hyperactive people like me. With the practice of Qigong, I still don't know why I feel very relaxed during the practice. At the end, and that calm continues throughout the day. Studies such as the Lung Strengthening Qigong program help to provide evidence of the efficacy of this form of exercise and yield a vast amount of experiential data reported by the participants. Our next planned research project is into the effect of a specially designed form of medical Qigong from Jiangxi University on improving the quality of sleep. We've already run a short two week course and feedback from participants is very promising. A full study on Qigong for improving sleep is being planned for this summer. Future studies will focus more on collecting biological data that is needed to help establish medical Qigong as a valuable tool for self-care that may, in the future, be prescribed by doctors. But more work is needed to bridge the divide between the different perspectives of Chinese and Western medicine to explain the underlying causes for the positive results achieved in studies such as the Lung Strengthening Qigong program. Further, there needs to be more translation work of research carried out in China and more opportunities for joint sharing of findings currently only published in Chinese scientific journals. But collaboration of international teams Pooling resources and expertise of different experts is gradually narrowing this divide. So um, that was our, our study of which we're, we're very proud that um, the work was done on that. There was so much that we found out from that study. Um, maybe some of those uh, descriptions from the diaries give you a little flavor. Um, so although the practice was very much geared at uh, creating immune system strength, strength in the lungs and kidneys, what was so clear was that for many people who had lots of underlying conditions, lots of chronic conditions, fatigue, headaches, um, digestive problems, that there's an overall effect from Qigong practice that feeds into, in a very holistic way, as Peter was mentioning in his talk, um, into our overall well-being. And a lot more work still needs to be done in that area. Um, next, I would like to invite Mauro Lugano to give us his presentation. Um, again, many of you may, may know Mauro. Um, since 2010, Mauro has been studying oriental manual therapies, as well as practicing traditional forms of Qigong and Tai Chi. Uh, he received instruction and collaborated with several leading Western teachers, and he also visited China and studied under ex Huaxia teachers, such as Yuan Tong Liu, uh, Tao Qing Yu, Zhao Lian Chen, and others. And he currently lives in Slovenia. So Mauro, we very much welcome you and are very interested to hear about the research you've been doing. Thank you. Um, first of all, I'm very happy uh, on how I see this is the, the direction that it's taking into the future. Uh, thank you, Chu Wanfeng and you, Christina. I would like to use this time for talking about the, the presentations. I can share them, but I think I will do this very fast and actually use the time um, 
for showing or for asking you <laughs> some questions instead. Um, this is the project we are currently taking on. Uh, I thought uh, my friend Andras was present here. I don't see him now. Um, if he is, then I'd ask him to, to take part also. Um, to say a few words. I'm here, Mauro. Thank you. Um, super. Thank you, Andras. Um, so this is the, the project we are taking currently. Um, it's called Breathing with Nature. Um, we co-developed it with Andras, and Andras is part of a Drushtvo, it's a society here in Slovenia that is called um, Šola Zdravia. Um, it's a non-governmental organization that could be translated as health school, and it's a humanitarian organization. Maybe Andras can share more information about them. He's uh, working for them. And basically, what we are doing with this is we, through this group that they've been, they have a history already in Slovenia, they are very rooted in society already, and they have a pro, like an approach for physical health, for physical well-being, mainly in older generation for few, I think more than a decade for sure in Slovenia. And recently since Andras became part of this society and we have interest and knowledge in Qigong, specifically in Junin Qigong, um, then we use this opportunity to introduce Qigong into this practice. And it was very coincident that um, since coronavirus situation, they ask um, how to improve also, not only to think about the physical health, but to incorporate into some sort of practice the um, self-awareness or how they call it, uh, here in the Western, the, um, what's the word? Um, like mindfulness, to, to be aware of oneself. So for us, it was very clear that this was a uh, Qigong approach, like the inward approach of Qigong practice. So not to put up red flags, because in, in society, it's not well known still what is Qigong. Um, for example, in the past, uh, yoga was very well known as a physical practice, but we know that uh, society would take it, you know, um, kind of uh, with a reluctant, uh, uh, if we would openly say that it's a Qigong practice. So we presented it as a breathing method, as a breathing exercise that or better, as an exercise that incorporates breathing, meditation, and movement. And all of this in the context of going outward and being in nature. So the practice takes between one hour and one hour and a half. Basically, we walk into nature, we gather the group. Uh, it's open and free for anyone to join from any generation. There are kids coming sometimes. The main population is elder people, but mm, we, we have the intention to raise the younger generation also in this practice. And basically we gather, we walk into nature, um, we spend some, times, uh, some time in silence, surrounded by nature and trying to consciously connect with our senses, with the surrounding, being present and aware of the surrounding in nature. And then bring the awareness inward during the practice. And for the practice itself, we used um, basically three or four exercises of Qigong that we know from body and mind method of Junen Qigong from Tai Chi uh, Paul, also from Tai Chi Chuan. And um, then in this current year, in 2023, um, I'm going a little bit to jump ahead to the the Ministry of Health of Slovenia, they, we presented the previous uh, year's uh, pilot study that we did with these groups, and it was very well received. Andras did a very, work, very good work presenting this to the Ministry of Health, and they fin financed this project for the coming three years. So this is the first year of this coming three years, and we incorporated some new exercises, more focused on breathing, 
on circulation of qi between the inner organs, although we still don't say that it's about circulation of qi, we call it like a visualization, internal visualization. And then um, after the practice is done, we take again some time to be in quiet in the nature. And normally in that time, we can see already from the beginning of practice to the end of practice, our state changed already. And then we come back to the meeting point and the participants uh, can go home. Um, we're doing also in the pilot study and in this uh, current uh, beginning year, we are doing questionnaires, which this is what I wanted to, to use the time wisely to, to talk about this. Um, stop sharing this, Eva. Uh, to talk about this because the, um, what I think is all of our studies, uh, except for this last the bullet point that uh, Christina showed, and probably some of the the research they've done in China, they also thought about this in the past and they incorporated this. All of our studies are focusing on subjective, on how the participant sees itself and how it perceives itself. And I think it's very important for this Western viewpoint of our, our understanding of science that it has to have an objective um, support and incorporating biological um, measurements, I think this is the, the right direction to make a stronger research. Um, so, and this was my already my process in the previous research that we also did with Andras and with this Drushbo, with this society, that it was based on school environment, not on general population, but in kids in the school. So how through the practice of, qi, of Qigong and but mostly Jin and Qigong, but not only Jin and Qigong, how we could uh, improve the quality in the school environment. So the kids would have a better experience at school and also a better academic result. Um, this was our first study that we did in 2018, I think we did the pilot study, and then in 2019, we continued with a more formal study and we incorporated also a control group. They gave us, I can share later on links to the research where they are published or share the, the um, files here on the chat. So you can read them by yourself and I don't use this time for, for showing the presentation. But basically what we received in that time, it was like a problematic group of a school. And at the beginning of the study, we did some tests and it showed up, it was true, it was, uh, they, they, they had a conflictive, you know, uh, group. We use questionnaires from psychologists to, to, to address this. And then through three months of practice, having only once per week with them, one hour with them per week, in three months, this group became like the uh, model of the school. It was better than the, than the rest of the school. So it was very promising um, what we know, but still we we never had um, how to say an objective measurement for this. Only um, the the kids um, explaining about themselves, the teachers talking about the kids, and the parents talking about the kids and how they saw them at the baseline and after the the intervention. If in, I think my, my intention in the future is how to incorporate this um, objective uh, measurement. And I think with having this opportunity of a lot of international friends, uh, well, uh, the, um, how to say, well educated in science, maybe we could together think about making protocols, a protocol, for example, for school environments, a protocol for health, uh, environment, a protocol for sports, and so on. I also work with uh, athletes. I teach them Tai Chi and uh, Qigong for athletic purposes. And I see, I, I can see, I can notice the improvement, <laughs> but the, there is no, um, or at least by myself as practitioner or teacher, I cannot 
measure that improvement formally. And that's why I'm interested also in, in this and in getting more connection with other people from, from science background and see if there is a possibility of developing protocols for measuring this improvement. So this is my, my grain of, uh, of salt here. <laughs> if Andras, you want to add something? Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you, Mauro. Uh, I would add that uh, we actually are just two teachers of uh, John and Qigong in Slovenia. So what we did this year, actually, we um, uh, we had a workshop with 25 um, people uh, doing theory and practice, and we spread this um, knowledge to 25 groups, which are actively working now on the project of um, breathing with nature. And uh, like my purpose for, for this year was to, to these new students who actually began teachers really soon, to give them knowledge for uh, organizing a chi field. So they, um, they their self become uh, calm and this affects all the group. So um, what I, am missing in, in our opportunity in Slovenia is that uh, we have uh, like measurements for the first month in March, it's 700 people attending uh, this uh, project. So we're uh, practicing with us and because of uh, cold weather, rain and uh, wind in Slovenia, uh, I believe that the number will go will grow bigger in April and May. So we have of opportunity to to uh, capture a lot of people and uh, we kind of miss uh, these protocols like Mauro said so how to to measure effect because we we uh, we are now in progress of uh, the questionnaire but uh, still uh, I um, I'm wondering how how in other options we have how to collect um, more information and to um, record the progress of people. So uh, this because we are uh, starting this uh, uh, project, uh, we are um, most happy if uh, we get some help from uh, other more experienced researchers. Thank you, Mauro. Thank you, Andras. And uh, yeah, uh, maybe also you can count with our this big platform of uh, volunteers that we have and people who are starting to practice Qigong for free in the whole country pretty much so we could incorporate um, practitioners to, to this uh, research of Liping Qigong for example or for future uh, researches we could open uh, this um, like base of uh, volunteers to, to join this practice. I shared in the chat the these files and the PowerPoint, I think, also. Maro, thank you very much. And thank you also, Andras. Um, again, so many interesting points coming out. Um, I noted with interest um, your comments about um, that you've called your program Breathing with Nature, and perhaps you've not drawn attention to the Qigong aspect. Um, and I think that is true that people haven't necessarily known very much what Qigong is in the West. And it's at a much earlier stage of its development than obviously something like yoga is today. But yoga has also gone through a similar trajectory. And um, but, it, but it also raises interesting questions from the point of view of research because um, how, to what extent does it matter? I pose this question, to what extent does it matter for research purposes if people know or have an understanding of the Chinese medicine principles of Qigong, an understanding of what Qi is? Um, you know, at what point is that important? At what point is that not important for their practice? Um, but it also, I think, raises another very important question that you touched on, which is how you attract different kinds of groups of people to the practice. So 
if you advertise a Qigong group, and I know from our own weekly Qigong group, these are people who self-select. These are people who, who come to the practice because maybe they've tried it a little before. They, it helps them. They believe in it. They enjoy it. They get benefit from it. Um, and of course, then they're quite interested in some of the underlying principles and they want to go more deeply into it. Another very general point about that kind of group is they tend to be, just from the demographic work that we did on the lung strengthening Qigong exercise, they tend to be a little bit older. They tend to be maybe mid to late 40s, 50s, 60s. They tend to be women rather than men, very sweeping generalizations. And there may be very good reasons why that practice appeals to them. Uh, and at that time, if you're a woman, maybe you're entering into your, your menopause and you have all kinds of health and mental health issues. At that time, our health in general, whether male or female, starts to change and we focus a lot more on it. There's also a question of maturity. At that stage in our lives, we've been through a lot of life experiences and we, we look for, for things with meaning as well. So I think you know, your suggestions, Mauro, about developing protocols for different environments, like for a school environment, um, for sports, for, for other groups, and maybe having different ways of presenting the exercise is, is something that's very interesting and I, I think would be really worthwhile exploring some more. So, well, thank you for that. I mean, sorry, those, those are my sort of immediate sort of responses to that. Um, still conscious of time. Um, I'd, I'd like next for everybody to hang on to their questions still. And I'd like next to invite um, Chitlali from Mexico to give us her presentation. So a little bit of background on Chitlali Alvarez. She obtained her degree in biology at the Faculty of Sciences of the National Autonomous University of Mexico and her Master's of Science degree at Dalhousie University, Halifax, Nova Scotia, in Canada. In 2011, she started as a practitioner of Jinan Qigong, and in 2015, she became a certified instructor with the Beijing Wisdom Healing Center in China. She has 10 years experience in science communication, and she's published 21 articles in science communication in diverse journals. She's also published six research articles uh, on the subject of Junung Qigong. So, so please welcome Chitlali and um, looking forward to hearing her talk now. Thank you, Christina. Hello, everybody. It's really nice to meet you. So I made a presentation for you. Let me start with the presentation. Okay, let me move this. My name is Itlali Alvarez. I'm a biologist and a Zen and Chikun instructor. I'm currently living in Mexico City. And every time that I talk about Zen and Chikun, I always express my deep gratitude to teacher Pang. He is the Zen and Chikun creator. And he has been sharing all the knowledge with the humankind. Also, I want to express my gratitude to my teachers because they have been passing me that knowledge. And now, of course, to you for allowing me to be part of this meeting. Thank you so much, Christina. This, this means a lot to me. Thank you very much. Since I got my certification as an instructor, I have been teaching children and adults. And at the same time, I have been doing some research projects, always supported by great people, like the Italian team with teacher Ramon, the Malaysia team with teacher Oi, the China team with teacher Gao, teacher Tong, teacher Yuan, and of course the Mexican team. All of them have participated in one way or another in different projects. And for me, it's really important to mention them and to thank them. So the projects that we have made in Mexico have been done with practitioners and with external chi. With practitioners. 
We work at the school for the blind. We work with diabetic students with acquired visual disability. We measure glucose levels, body weight, and blood pressure. We practice one hour a day, three times a week for three months. And the results were that the students lost weight and glucose levels went down. Blood pressure stayed the same. This article was published by Chi, the Journal of Traditional Eastern Health and Fitness. Then we work uh, with a bakery products company with 19 employees. We measure quality of life. We use the World Health Organization uh, quality of life questionnaire endorsed by Mexicans. And we practice 30 minutes a day for six days a week for two months. Results, quality of life was improved and also the students report enhanced physical performance, better posture, greater strength, more vitality, more patient, higher concentration and less stress. This article also was published by the Journal of Traditional Eastern Health and Fitness. Then we work at an, an elementary school with children ranging 7 to 11 years old. We measure immediate and working memory, attention level, compulsivity control, general state of health, energy levels and brain response. We practice 45 minutes a day, five days per week for three months. And the results, the immediate and working memory and the attention level were improved. Impulsivity control and general state of health improved, but didn't show a static a statistical significant difference. Levels, levels of energy and brain response stay the same. This, this article is in process of being published. Now, talking about projects with external chip. We work at the National University of Mexico City, at the Tissue Culture Lab, we work with plants in danger of extinction and we measure plant growth in vitro. We have experimental and control group. An experimental group re received external chin for um, 30 minutes a day, three days per week for five weeks. The results the plants that developed roots, roots of the experimental group were almost double compared to the control group. Here you can see the, the image. It was 27.5 for the experimental group compared to the control group, 15%. And also the roots were larger and thicker in the experimental group. Here, let me show you, you can see some of them. The, these the, the roots are uh, bigger compared with the with the control group. Um, the average the average of the length from the experimental group was greater than the plants of the control group. However, there was not a statistically significant difference. This article was published by the International Journal of Research in Agricultural Science. Then we work at the Herpetari at the National University of Mexico City. 
with reptiles. This time we measure body weight. The reptiles receive external chi 15 minutes twice a week for six weeks. The results, reptiles increase an average of 415 grams on body weight. Also, reptiles modify their, their behavior in the terrarium from being inactive to be more active and their skin, skin improve in softness. Uh, this project was published as a short communication by the International Journal of Veterinary Science. Then we went to the Caribbean Sea. This time we worked with, at the National Institute of Fisheries and Aquaculture in Puerto Morelos, Quintana Roo, Mexico, at the Coral Nursery. We measure survival and growth. And we had experimental and control group. So we work with two different genotypes. This is a 16 coral fragments from one genotype and 16 coral fragments for a second genotype. For the control group, total 32 fragment corals and the same for the experimental group. And the experimental group received external chi 10, 10 minutes for seven days per week for three weeks. And the results for survival. Here is the control group for uh, coral fragments survived. And for the experimental group, 25 coral fragments survived. So uh, the experimental group survived more than the control group. It was 78% of survival versus 12.5. And to analyze growth, we use the EMAS-G program and also experimental group grew more than control group. This article was published by the Tsenenchikun Science Worldwide magazine. And then coming back to the National University, uh, we work at the genetic lab. We work with fruit flies exposed to chemicals to induce genetic change. And flies, we had control and experimental group. So the control group, the flies receive external chi 10 minutes for 15 consecutive days. And we work with the entire cycle of the flies from eggs to adults. Adults. So here are the eggs, the different stage of larva, the pup, and here you can see the adults. They are tiny. Those are the fruit flies. Everybody knows the fruit flies. So the Finally, we got the results and on Tuesday we will have a meeting. It seems that there are change. So I will tell you what happened, but this Tuesday we will have a meeting about the, the results. I'm, I'm, I'm really excited to see what happened. Um, well, what, what's next? Uh, I'm planning a retreat here in Mexico City, a five days retreat. So I'm gonna measure stress and pain levels before and after the retreat. And we also are writing a project. Um, we, we want to measure stress, anxiety, and depression in a hospital nursery staff. So we hope we um, next month we finish the project and start to with, the, with present, presenting with the, to the hospitals. So this is my email, Jessica. 1967 at yahoo.com. If you want to read the whole articles, uh, write me an email and I can send you the articles to you. Okay. Uh, finally, I just want to say that I really enjoyed to be part as a team 
So if you have one project uh, on your mind, or if you need some assistance, I will be more than happy to help you. And thank you. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Chitlali. Um, again, so many interesting insights and, and thank you for the invitation to, to contact you and to, to participate. I think this is so much needed and I know that um, certainly welcomed by Mauro with all the work you're doing there and very much welcomed by us and our team. And uh, your research also reminds me of presentations that we had back in December uh, from Jansi University students who were also using external chi um, in different kinds of scenarios, in different kinds of situations. And I know, Zhang Yan, you're, you're continuing with this kind of research as well. And that really brings home to me the huge richness that is contained in um, you know, the treasure that is Qigong, that, as Peter said, has got thousands of different forms. But what is beginning to, to come to scientific research and attention is how it can be deployed in different kinds of situations. Um, I was also very interested in your talk, Lali, about um, the, the different situations and the different kind of groups of people um, who took part in different kinds of exercise, you know, from, from children and, um, and adults, and how the effect of Qigong is so far reaching. It is very much a whole life um, kind of benefit. Yes, it can be targeted for different conditions, for different kinds of health situations, but something that is um, a tool for us for, to, to be the very best people that we can be in our work, in our lives, in our personal situation. So, you know, so much more for people to discover and uh, to see that this is something that we can all use. So, so thank you so much for your insights and really pleased to, to hear from you. Um, so we finally, last but by no means least, um, I would like to ask uh, Feisha to, to come and share her insights with us. Um, a little introduction to Feisha. Um, she is one of our Confucius Institute uh, colleagues because she is um, she is director of the Confucius Institute at the University of Central Lancashire and she's also principal lecturer there. She's currently course leader for an MA in interpreting and translation. In the area of Taiji Qigong and well-being, Feisha is a senior instructor at the British Health Qigong Association and an indoor disciple of Chen Hua, uh, Xiao Wang, Grandmaster in Chun style Tai Chi. She also qualified as an exercise and recuperation instructor at Beijing Sports University. After three extended stays at a yoga ashram in India, Feisha is also a senior yoga instructor with the Yoga Alliance. And her Qigong classes typically fuse different aspects of Dao Yin and yoga. So Feisha, if I could ask you to um, tell us about your work. Yes, great. Yeah, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Christina, for your invitation. And thank you to the previous speakers, fascinating topics. I would really love to know more. And uh, uh, here is uh, a little, I think for me, rather than reporting on the on the results, am I, am I sharing screen now? Yes. Uh, no, you're not sharing. No, you're not sharing. Yeah, I better, I better click the share first. Uh, where's the share screen? Uh, yeah, I found it. Okay. Is it sharing now? Uh, yes, we can see your okay. screen. Yeah, that's wonderful. Great. Thank you very much. And here, I think uh, I, I would like to use this as an opportunity to reflect on some of the achievements, the barriers and opportunities in research into Tai Chi and Qigong in, in the UK. And I think it's more this reflection about what uh, Euclid Confucius Institute has been doing. And when I said uh, that is the research at the university, and it's because uh, our university uh, so far, uh, no other units is doing work on this uh, in this area. 
So my aim of the reflection is to share what, what we've been doing, but also more importantly, to invite your advice on how to overcome those uh, barriers or challenges and how we could work together. So what I'll briefly tell you, a joint project uh, between uh, UCLAN's Innovation Clinic and the Confucius Institute, which happened uh, a couple of years ago. And then we'll also talk, I'll also tell you about something that we've just started to do with COVID-8, which is a charity for long COVID based in Scotland. And then I'll share with you some of the discussions we are talking about potential new projects and that they are in very early stages of uh, planning. So what we've done so far is uh, in February 2021, a colleague approached me and said, shall we go for some bidding? There is the research assistantship and also using my company, uh, they also managed to get some funding from the EU is the European Development Fund. And this funding was finally granted in April. And then we went through the ethics application in May. Finally, in June, we were able to start up uh, the project, started data collection and inviting people to join the, join the project. And the aim is uh, we wanted to investigate whether there is any barriers to Taiji and Qigong courses. That basically came from uh, me as an instructor. I struggle probably like many of you trying to reach a bigger audience. And, and I was asking myself the question, why is yoga far more attractive and get, get a lot more participants than Taiji and Qigong? And what can we learn from yoga? And also, uh, we wanted to measure the changes in subjective well-being, sleep qualities, any pain or functions, uh, pre and post uh, intervention. So when the project started, we managed to get 21 participants to take part. And uh, only 14 of them uh, were able to return the questionnaire. But also we lost some of the data because uh, for ethical re ethics reasons, we can't identify uh, the returned or the questionnaire by names. So we only use their phone numbers uh, to identify the match the post and pre questionnaire in order to do the analysis. But some people did not uh, put in the, the same phone numbers. Uh, so we were, we were not able to include their data in the final analysis. But in terms of scale, we the project went on for six weeks of uh, online courses, five times a week, uh, Monday to Friday, and each lesson was 30 minutes. Now, we didn't say you have to attend all five, but we encourage people to do a minimum of twice two classes a week. And also the, the times, the timing were uh, scattered uh, across the day in, in different times so that we wanted to maximum the number of participants. And even though at that time, I think uh, in the UK, uh, lockdown was already relaxed and people can return to work in the office. So to make it easier for people to participate, we varied the participation time. Also, we did didn't make recordings. Uh, the reason we didn't make recordings was partially consideration for health and safety. And um, because we won't be there to see if anybody's uh, fall over, etc. Uh, the output is a recent submission of a paper entitled Understanding the Barriers and Benefit of uh, Online Tai Chi and Qigong. The reason, I, I know I'm sort of like not being very strict for this conference. This conference is only talking about Qigong, but I've included the Tai Chi. And that is because the after the consideration that in the UK, I feel more people know about Tai Chi, or at least they've heard about Tai Chi than Qigong. So if I simply use 
use uh, qigong, uh, perhaps we get less participants. So uh, we use both tai chi and qigong. And for that, I also, out of the five days a week of uh, classes, one day is on ba shi tai chi, is the most simplified form. And I justified the, the fact that I could mix them is because I think the underlying principle is the same. It's sort of like uh, using deep breathing, slow flowing movements, and uh, uh, both disciplines are very, very uh, gentle and low intensity. Uh, also, I just sort of justify it in the sense of uh, many of the uh, Qigong instructors or Tai Chi instructors, they provide both. So there is no real clear cut from the perceptions point of view, from the practitioner's uh, point of view, at least for beginners. And obviously, once you get deeper into the practice, then a, a lot of the differences begin to appear. Okay, so the findings, because we were mainly measuring the, the barriers to Tai Chi and Qigong's uh, uptake, so the, the findings more or less focusing on that is uh, we found that in-person classes are not essential in terms of uh, for the participants to have measurable changes in the, in, in the quality of sleep, in the pain reduction, etc. Uh, but we also found that hybrid delivery is preferred that they the participants feedback were saying that they very much uh, like the in uh, online uh, live classes but they would prefer to have recordings in case they missed a session and then they would also like some in-person workshops if possible they cited the reason as uh, because uh, when the class is delivered the camera is is facing the the instructor, even though the instructor did at times when suitable turn around, but there is no side views as such, and and you can't have both. So so a, a Zoom class could never replace a real person in person workshop. So that that is what they were saying. However, they do reported the uh, the benefit and how much they enjoyed the class. And to make it also one of the, the things we were asking them, would they continue? They say, yes, they will certainly continue with uh, online classes when possible because they find it's more accessible because there's no traveling time. They don't need to consider car parks, travel, and uh, also cost. This is a free course. The whole six weeks were, were free. And even at uh, if they were to pay for it, it would still be more affordable than going going to a gym and taking the classes in person. Uh, they would, uh, the, uh, the one of the findings is we would uh, try to have projection of instructors from multiple angles. And at the moment, we've not put it in practice yet, but that certainly in consideration for the future is to have uh, two cameras and maybe just have one screen as the, the main person and the other, uh, maybe a phone on the side so you can take a side view as well. Uh, also, there was an unexpected uh, finding because we were just measuring about Tai Chi and Qigong, mainly focusing on the discipline. But what we found is this digital inequality uh, that was highlighted because there were people wanted to do it, uh, but they can't do it because the they, the the phone is too small and they don't know how to project it onto a TV screen, etc. Or they were waiting for the children to come home and help them to set it up. Uh, some of them also find it too difficult to look at uh, uh, iPad, even though the iPad is not too small. But by the time you've taken three steps away from the screen so that I could see them, uh, then it becomes too small. And it's difficult for them to, to see. One other outcome that came outcomes that came out from it is uh, we feel we need to provide more educational content about uh, Tai Chi and Qigong. We want to make them more uh, available. I think it's interesting. It, it touches upon what uh, Christine have just uh, raised a question. It's sort of like uh, at, one, at what point would some understanding of TCM principles or Qigong be necessary for participants? 
uh, my experience is uh, the more they understand it, the better they they would be able to immerse themselves in the practice. And also, uh, like you mentioned before, most of uh, well, all my participants were adults, older adults, and being adult learners, they want to understand why they want the intellectual side, they want the brain to be engaged as well. And uh, so, so that was what happened, uh, what we've been doing in the past couple of years. And now we've just started a new project with uh, a charity called COVID Aid. And uh, this is the, the UK's national COVID-19 charity. I think we are very fortunate to be commissioned to deliver the 40 weeks of uh, Qigong classes. And for that, the, the final thing we've uh, agreed to deliver is 40 weekly uh, live sessions, but then recordings will be provided, but it's only kept for one week. This is to stop people thinking about, oh, the, the classes are there. I can do it anytime I want. But we say, well, no, if you miss one, you, you have to motivate yourself to catch up in that week. But we also tell them not to worry because uh, it's very slow paced. They don't have to remember all the movements because the instructor will be there to guide them. And uh, Life Every Week supported by recordings for self-practice. The challenges we found so far is uh, at the moment we are still putting the ethics uh, uh, through for approval before we can start data collection. And that's also because of health and safety concerns, because we can't have people joining us and um, with no camera on or, or for the recording for when, when they want to practice. Uh, if they live totally on their own and they don't have access to like pick up a, a phone call to ask a neighbor or somebody to support them, then we feel that it's, it's quite risky because they are in a way self-referred uh, as uh, long COVID patients. The other problem we've encountered is the definition of our subjects because at, at the moment there is well, if any, uh, specialist uh, clinics to to test people, to refer people for long COVID. And uh, at the moment, we, there, there's no GP referral to, to the charity. So they are all self-referred. They call themselves as long haulers. And so they may, because of that, they may have other conditions that, that we are not aware of. Now, to what extent it, it becomes a problem uh, we don't know. We are still uh, discussing with our School of uh, Medicine and uh, Sports and Wellbeing. Uh, we are working together on that to find out. Uh, the other problem is because of a funding cut that uh, for research, we wanted to have a research assistant to help us to gather and analyze uh, data. At the moment, we are still working on it. And I wanted to hear your advice as how, how should we design this research? And in terms of the routines we use, it's very much a mixture of deep breathing, slow, flowy movements, and there are some lung strengthening uh, movements there as well. And finally, we end the session with some uh, petting for self-massage purpose. Okay, and so for research design, how we should uh, do that, and then for uh, any suggestions, how we could secure funding. The other uh, projects, the other two projects, we are at a very early stage of still discussing it is with uh, Ukraine's Healthy University Unit. Now, our university is one of the two founders of uh, the English National Healthy Universities Network. When we say English, it does, you don't have to be an English university. Actually, anybody can join, even overseas universities can join. You can just join as an associate member, which I've put a link at the bottom of the uh, this slide. And what are we hoping for for this project is to find a more effective way to promote Tai Chi Qigong as well-being tools to maintain health across the UK higher education institutions. We want to use Tai Chi and Qigong to combat mental health issues uh, among the student bodies. For example, through the uh, Wu Qingxi, the five animal frolics. 
And then because lots of problems um, for office workers, students, uh, university staff, many of them got neck, shoulders and back pain. And uh, in China, the Qigong uh, uh, is the health Qigong prescription. There's a lot of research being uh, conducted on it and uh, the implementation of different uh, Qigong prescription are, are doing quite well. So we thought we want to uh, learn from China of what is being done and then try to implement it in, in the UK. And the Ji the Dao Yin for spine realignment is what we've chosen to do. And then recently, our university's uh, occupational health has expressed an interest in Qigong as an intervention tool for hypertension. Now, we have a failed attempt in Parkinson's because we, we, with Parkinson's, we just maybe because of the timing, we put it on a Tuesday evening straight after work. Uh, we initially found a space for in-person classes, but nobody turned up. So we canceled it and then turned everything online. And then after we've canceled it, we had one or two people were requesting, but could we have it, put it back on in-person? We thought, well, because of uh, staffing pressure, we couldn't do that. But anyway, for with Parkinson's, it makes more sense to be an in-person class rather than a Zoom class because of the how stable then, how they carry their bodies is Etc. So the challenges is we wanted to get a bigger uptake across the network and then also uh, time commitment on healthy university champions because we rely on them to promote these opportunities. So this is one of the projects. The other projects is we recently started working with Manchester Museum. Manchester is an interesting city because it's one of the first uh, age-friendly cities in the world. And then they are also increasingly more and more museums are providing well-being programs in the museum, in the gallery themselves. I feel that they have the pressure of providing more for the for the funding they receive. And also during the week, they have a lot of empty space in the museums. Obviously not big museums in London, but a lot of the city museums, their galleries are not that busy. Okay, uh, and the Manchester Museum, they have a very good uh, well-being team. They also work with their colleagues with, in the social prescribing. Uh, uh, of interest, special interest to me and to the Confucius Institute is we have a broader remit to promote a culture, the Chinese culture. And then uh, there are research being done in prescribing culture, using culture as uh, intervention tools. So we are trying to find ways how we could further explore Tai Chi Qigong uh, as a traditional health enhancement practice uh, from China and then combining with the cultural elements. The challenges we face at the moment is because the project funded by Arts Council England, it's only for a six week program. And we are in the process of uh, bidding more funding to expand and, ex and establish the program on a longer term so that to enable data collection and also time commitments on research staff. So I think this is uh, what I wanted to share with you, and I very much invite, uh, wanted to hear your contribution. Aisha, thank you so much. What a lot of interesting things you have going on. It's it's great that within your university, you've also got um, interest in the health and well-being aspects um, that you know Chinese well-being culture can offer. And I think that's also very important because um, lots of Qigong practitioners and teachers uh, across the country um, do a fantastic job in promoting Qigong themselves, but also having uh, Taiji and Qigong embedded in some way in the university and having support you know, for that, for the benefits it can bring to their student communities and to other communities, I think is very important. So th thank you very much for sharing that. Um, I think a lot of the challenges that you mentioned are challenges that, that we're all familiar with as well. Um, you know, how you promote Qigong. I, I do think there's an awful lot in 
in it being a Chinese well-being practice and in getting across the, um, if you like, the meditative movement aspect that I think people can relate to. Um, and I do think that, that that barrier is gradually being worn down. I think one of the best ways of that barrier being worn down or that sort of um, uh, people becoming more familiar with the term and with what the practice can bring comes from word of mouth. And I certainly see in our own Qigong community um, that there is a steady trickle of people um, who ask to join the mailing list, who ask to join the practice. Um, they are often people with maybe some other background, not necessarily in Qigong itself, but maybe they've done some yoga or they've done some meditation or something else. So I do think that it's a slow process, but, but that is gradually changing. Um, but I think one of the the current themes that seems to have come out from the different presentations that we've had is what can we share? How can we support each other? How can we use the knowledge and expertise um, that we have amongst the different uh, contributors to support the work that's being done across, um, across the world in effect in different places? Um, so in the last 15 minutes or so, I'd, I'd really like to sort of open up that discussion um, and welcome comments from, from the different participants that we've got here or questions. Um, so please use this opportunity. So John, I can see you're very quick with your hand up. So please go for it. Apologies, I was hovering. I didn't mean to press it that quick. Hi everyone, uh, great to see you all. Um, I know a number of you, uh, I don't know an, a, a few others. Um, I've been working in the field of Qigong for over 20 years. And one of the things that I've found to be really useful is to not get caught up in the Chinese culture and the Chinese tradition that sits within it when I first interact with people. People buy benefits. People want to know what's in it for me. So the primary message um, is what's in it for them. So when I'm working with organizations and I'm talking about improving communication or developing leadership process, I'm still talking about Qigong, but I'm opening, it, I'm opening it up. And I'm curious from that point of view, what we can do with this research that makes it more relevant and asks that question. And I'd like to throw a second piece into this, if I may, because I think as somebody who's been interested in developing research for quite a few years and asked quite a lot of questions in the area, one of the pieces that I'm really aware of is that I don't want any research that I get involved in to demonstrate how good I may be in my own individual teaching practice. What I want it to do is show how a technique can be offered by somebody with minimal training and have huge impact. Because then what you do is you make the research really relevant to current Western healthcare. Because you can turn around and say, look, this particular strategy that we use, we can train up doctors or nurses or people with a relevant amount of experience. We can train them up in a day, two days, a week or whatever, and they can lead groups and have that much impact. That then ties back into the benefit. And if anybody's interested in doing that, I would love to work with them. I, excellent. Thank you, Mara. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, can I jump in? Uh, that's exactly what Andras tried to mention. We, I showed in the PowerPoint, if I may um, share screen again, or just I mention it fast. Ah, here it is. Uh, all of these people you see here in this in this picture, uh, they are actually volunteers that joined. Um, one, I mean, we had a couple of uh, meetings online like this, taught the methods, basically didn't speak about Qigong uh, per se, but taught the method, how to organize the Qi field, how to lead the practice, what to pay attention in their practitioners, how to avoid um, misdirection during their classes, and basically uh, instructed them so they could lead groups in whole Slovenia, in 24 locations in Slovenia. And that's why we now, during this first month of this practice, we reach 700 people in one month, because 
all of those people in the picture, they, they have practitioners in their groups now. So, but it's, it's a very valid question. And so far we agree on this same point, not mentioning that it is Qigong until we start, because later it becomes more and more important as they know more about the practice. But in the beginning, it's totally relevant. But later on, it becomes important. And yeah, and forming a, like a, a, a wide base of practitioners that could also help the research later on, because we would have a lot of people uh, available for, for doing the, the research. Can I jump in? <laughs> yeah. Sorry, sorry, I can't find the hand. Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, uh, just uh, uh, from a different perspective, we are working on uh, mobile applications, but they can be on any platform. And I think we had an initial conversation with John, I think if I remember. Um, so we, we are intending to use these mobile applications, for example, for uh, uh, with ther therapists, uh, with foster care children, uh, but as part of this uh, assessing their well-being, if you like. Uh, we offer childlike interventions or interventions that are easy to to uh, to be accessed by children working with the therapists. Um, and if there is any way that we can um, work towards, we, we can provide the expertise in developing applications, but we need the interventions to be done in such a way that can be accessible to young people um, or any anybody experiencing um, like foster care experiences or people with needing mental well-being so that that's one thing so it, it would it, if that is possible we we focus on digital health <laughs> so and not every, so for us uh, uh, delivering interventions online and perhaps uh, um, perhaps also comparing with in person is is something that we're interested in. Uh, I have uh, only uh, a couple of uh, points uh, about collaboration. Um, so we can uh, collaborate very, uh, very much straightforward in terms of recruitment for uh, assessing interventions, I would think. Um, like uh, as we are planning a sleep study, uh, it will be interesting to have uh, participants that you can access, have access to. Um, also, it's possible to collaborate, what I can see is possible to collaborate uh, in terms of delivering interventions. Uh, I'm not a Qigong uh, experienced trainer, but if, if different people deliver interventions and they're different interventions. Um, collaborations in applying for funding, <laughs> that's very welcome. Um, uh, collaboration in developing pro uh, protocols for data collection. Um, we have a, um, uh, an interdisciplinary uh, team, and previously uh, we have done some uh, studies in terms of the connection between leadership and uh, heart rate variability. <laughs> um, so, um, and in terms of the quality of space in an organization, and is it connected with physiological parameters? But uh, in a nutshell, we work with physiologists who are um, um, experienced in heart rate variability analysis. Uh, and heart rate variability is a kind of a holistic um, biomarker about the coherence of the body. <laughs> um, and uh, in addition to, so, so we, we are very interested in working towards implementing such measures. They're not very cost, costly then <laughs> um, um, this in, in connection with other holistic measures probably skin conductivity is used very much in psychology and assessing um, th there is research showing that skin conductivity shows the internal state of the electromagnetic field of the body <laughs> okay there, there is research I, I can share that um, and uh, uh, this is maybe a wishful thinking that there are machines now that measure the aura and the biophoton, and there are people working in Europe and in uh, Russia, uh, and there are machines that, that do that. <laughs> um, but uh, the more accessible parameters, I would say, are uh, heart rate, heart rate variability, and uh, uh, skin conductivity. Um, 
Um, and uh, so um, it's very interesting when you mentioned, several people mentioned the tree field. Um, I would like to hear maybe, uh, there is no time now, but uh, how do you organize the tree field? What does it mean? And can we measure the tree field in terms of, uh, because as our interventions uh, are delivered online, Mm, okay, so the, in, in my understanding, uh, the field will, uh, uh, will um, kind of involve the fields of the participants as well as the teacher. What is the impact of the teacher's field or what is the impact of the whole experiment? Because you can't exactly repeat it. Repeat it. Um, is there any way to assess this? I don't, I, I know that in China they do, they do such assessments. So if, uh, and, um, 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 is there any way, um, or does anybody know, of um, involving, uh, delivering qigong, qigong through art activities? <laughs> um, and, and that's, I think, uh, I've got all the points that, uh, don't, I mean, sorry for putting a, like a list in front of you. <laughs> Petia, could you please share your mail in the chat so we can stay in contact? Yes, yes, uh, yeah, of course. Uh, I will also share one link that may be interesting for you about from Dr. Pangs uh, when he was in Fasha, he published this as uh, material for study and recently was translated into English and may be interesting for all of us in the science field, um, which there is the link for the for that book that's been recently translated to English yeah. and it touches upon, for example, art. Uh, it also touches upon okay. the chief field. So. <laughs> okay, so maybe uh, I'll share what I shared before with uh, with you, Chris. Uh, the book, The Invisible Rainbow, is amazing, um, and uh, it is by Zhang um, Ling Zhang, uh, and it is available. Great, thank you for that. Um, adding to our, our essential reading, which is very helpful. <laughs> um, I can see that Faish has had her hand raised. So, so thanks for waiting and, and could you okay. also? Yeah. Uh, uh, and I, I've got this question for Sitali. Uh, wonderful, wonderful, really interesting research that you are doing. And uh, I really wanted to know, how do you get the children to calm down and do uh, Neng Qi Gong with you? Because I, I tried, my, my colleague have tried, we failed. We couldn't get primary schools or any schools to book us for more than a taster session because the slow flowing movements, while adults appreciate it, children, they, they become restless. What I found is the Tibetan singing bowls will be able to calm them down, get their attentions and settle the energy. But Failing that, they much prefer. I mean, we tried the uh, Wu Qingxi, the five animal play, and we tried the uh, uh, dragon dance. And these type of things are more welcomed by schools and by the children. So I really wanted to learn from you. What are your tips to get the children to do Zhi Neng Qi Gong? Thank you. Well, it has not been easy. Any of the research, uh, I have knocking so many doors and present myself and ask and asking for because everything has been for free um, all the research i support the research i i don't have any funding so i i have one friend that the kids were in the school so it was everything is like a friend a network i say hey can you help me i i can do that and uh, you ask to the school and everything. So, and with my students, my own students in like particular students talk with the parents. I really love children. For me are uh, amazing. I have learned so much for the kids. So I talk a lot with the parents. Uh, the parents are my students. And then when they uh, see the results, so then I ask, hey, I have a workshops. I have many workshops for the kids. So basically is um, talking with parents, talking with friends and a lot of work <laughs> and a lot of work for free. 
So it's not easy. It's not easy to get the students. Uh, you have to do also a lot of publicity. So if you are good for um, media, I'm not good for media. I, I'm, a, I'm a, a biologist. I'm not good for media. So I have to work and pay for someone else to help me to get the students. But the instructors that are really good for media, like uh, Facebook, WhatsApp, and TikTok, and everything, they have a lot of students. So you have to do a lot of work in, on, on the media, uh, publicity, and then uh, talk about with the parents. That, that's my techniques so far. Now, the children are getting older. They, are, they, they grew. So now their interesting are changing. They were really happy with me meditating and having fun, but now they are uh, they are looking like for the girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever. So <laughs> now I, I'm adapting to, to, to the change to the kids. Uh, but it's, it's really, really lovely uh, working with, with children. I love that. I, I really love that. So I just I suggest you do some uh, publicity with parents and, and and send the kids to you. Thank you. Could I, could I at this point ask uh, Peter Zhu Van Feng to? I know he's got a question and or wants to respond to uh, John's question. So so Peter, could you uh, come in next? Oh, okay. And uh, just now, I think uh, John's question is very uh, meaningful. So in modern uh, society, we require the short time and uh, have a big uh, effect. Most of us want this, especially someone who did not know Qigong. And uh, I think this is the advantage of Jinnan uh, Qigong, or we can say the TCM Qigong in our university. For example, in China, and also as my own teaching experience, our teaching is different as like this one week, only one or two times. Normally we give it, a, in fact, normally we give it a workshop for five days continually and uh, one week, two weeks. Each day practice like six hours, eight hours. So we have the different style of showing Qigong. As my experience, when I go to the foreign country, give the workshop for normally it's one day, three days, five days, five days at the most. Normally for many problems, many disease, for me, when I give the workshop, many of these in five days, for the participants, many of them can feel the effect. I'm not sure the test in the hospital, how it can be, but at least the feedback, many of them in five days practice, they can give the very good feedback. So it's totally possible. Also for other teachers, they have the similar experience. And this, we use the chip yield, as Patia said. This chip yield, is, has a close connection with the information. With the Qigong, Jinnan Qigong, we use the chi field. We use the entire information to change the whole state. Yeah. To so change the whole state of the life of the body. So it is possible to have a quick change. The reason why we, why we sometimes, we do the research, we talk about two weeks, four weeks, that's because our mindset think it take time because the doctors always told us, oh, this problems many years, it cannot be, it's nearly impossible to recover for so long time. But in fact, in fact, in Jinnan Qigong, we have many, many cases of very fast recovery. So it's totally possible, yeah, for Jinnan Qigong, for the TCM Qigong in our university is, possible in several days can have change, even very big change. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Peter. I mean, these are all very complex issues of um, 
what someone can learn, a practitioner can learn in order to deliver a particular part of an exercise or a particular exercise, um, how much background they need to have, how often that person needs to practice. I have to say that from our recent experience, Peter led us in a two week program uh, for sleep improving Qigong. And he very kindly got up at the crack of dawn in China so that he could practice with our group at 9.30 at night here in the UK. And having that nightly practice for half an hour or 40 minutes, um, certainly from the feedback from the group, that there was something very important about that. It was practicing together, there was a community feel, there was the habit that was being formed, which is very important. Um, and um, it's the regularity. So that there was something very important about that. John, you've got your hand up. Please go ahead. Okay, I'll keep it. I'll keep it very short because I'm I'm aware of time. And uh, just to say hi to Peter, I I I met you ten years ago in Hainan, and uh, the memory has stuck with me. So uh, it's lovely to see you again. Um, just quickly on the different ways to teach, one of the things that I found is working, especially in the corporate sector, you can have an intervention with somebody using Qigong that lasts maybe 10 or 15 minutes. And if you do it in such a way that means that they understand the benefit and they buy into the practice, you only need 10 or 15 minutes. And then three months later, they come back to you and tell, tell you about all the amazing things that have happened because they learnt that technique with the idea. Um, now, that isn't the pure version of Qigong, but it's a really powerful way that we can interact with people. These are the things that I think would be fascinating to teach because, you know, I'm very much like you. I, I learn very slowly. I have to go in, on retreat. I have, to, I have to go through things over and over and over again, but I increasingly meet people who you can share a very small amount of information with in a very simple practice and they can go and do amazing things. And I'm interested in these different strategies for teaching, because uh, I think we can actually do something very powerful there. I'd, I'd also like to add a point there that um, during our sleep Qigong course, uh, Peter delivered four lectures. And at the beginning of each talk, we would just have a couple of minutes when Peter set up the chi field. And we all of us has had that silence, getting our postures, getting our bodies into the place, getting into a, a kind of a chi state. And I have to say that is a, a very, very good way to, to start something where you want to absorb the information. Um, I just would like to read out, there's a, there's a comment here from Danny uh, Golding. I work in physical education, teacher education training, and looking at ways to integrate Qigong into the PE curriculum. PE teachers can use their existing knowledge of pedagogy uh, to finding engaging ways of delivering Qigong. Also looking at integration in sports uh, psychology. So feel free to, to contact Danny. Danny, thank you for that. And I think that's also very interesting if, if we can out of this meeting today, people can be uh, in touch with each other um, and actually share you know, information. Um, Petya asks a question, which I think is something that I would like to hear. Maybe this can be our final one uh, from Peter and Zhang Yan. What is meant by consciousness awareness or consciousness in TCM? Big topic. <laughs> Peter or Zhang Yan, please could you tell us in two minutes? <laughs> Okay, two minutes is quite a big challenge. Impossible, um, but do your best. <laughs> uh, but what I want to say is, first, I uh, thank you so much for your wonderful speeches. And uh, what I want to say is, there are some similarities between Qigong and yoga and uh, meditation. All the things are together with uh, uh, introspective consciousness. We draw our mind inward to our body. Uh, by all means, not uh, Tai Chi, yoga, or everything, all in the same direction. So we have some similarities. And there's one another thing is about the pandemic, the COVID-19. There are some good ways for, from it, like by through this pandemic, people are getting used to draw their mind inward, whether by the uh, lockdown or these outside things, or the inside thing, people are start to search inside. So this is a quite good opportunity to us, such like Lance Johnson Qigong, we have recruited so many participants through that time. 
So that is an opportunity for us to search inside. Uh, maybe the lung strengthening Qigong is, could be a good example. And another thing about the qi field, actually this time, this big time is a qi field actually worldwide thing. So we all together in here and our consciousness, consciousness our awareness are all in here, while uh, all these think, uh, think one thing together. So this actually is a qi field. Uh, so of course, I'm, I'm the youngest so among us all. I'm not so experienced as you all, uh, but from my side, the TCM, uh, because the, we always said TCM Qigong, Zhineng Qigong, Professor Pang Heming also is a professor in our university also is a TCM doctor, uh, but also me and myself is a TCM doctor too. There are lots of similarities or some source in TCM and Qigong. We could say Qigong is a part of TCM, but beyond TCM, so many things we can achieve uh, throughout, not only limited by TCM, in a lot of other ways like plants, uh, Sitali just said, and we have used it, used key field in so many fields, in such like such like my experiment for now for reds and for the lots of things, lots of materials things together. So we have show a big world view, not only limited in health and in all other areas we can show our qigong with our qi fields power we can put it in here so i think the awareness what we are what we are doing for now is we are setting up a qi field all together in this worldwide scan and we all together setting up a qi field for achieving a better world so this is a really a big world but uh, what we want to do is from the little thing together, from our outside, Jiangxi University of Chinese Medicine, and we start from the human being, the human's health from the TCM, and we do data, lots of experiment for uh, searching the function of qi field. And we worked on lots of disease, such like diabetes and insomnia, like Peter has done, uh, is doing. So from this disease, these patients uh, need to get their health back, get their healthy back. So they are really, they really stick onto Qigong exercise. Their Qigong is really attractive to them. So the uh, patients are really, mm, for, from outside, it's easy to be handled. We can recruit patients to here and do the Qigong exercise. And for children, uh, Fei Xia just said, and asked this question to Sitella, Sitali, right? So uh, we have this experience too. We, uh, I have a little patient who is, she's a little girl, just two years old, and she's suffering from a really a cancer on the liver. So what we do, we, what we did is not ask her to do Qigong exercise. We just put her in the Qi field and with, his, with her parents, with her family, we do this Qi, we set up this Qi field all together and do some Po Qi Dang or the La Qi exercise, just to make the consciousness work, make the, our mind work, just straight onto her cancer and make it uh, gone away. So it has worked. And not only for this little girl, but also for the other child, other children, they can also be benefit from it. Like the Dun Xiang, the squad uh, against the war, that exercise is used worldwide, worldwide very widely in China for children's intelligence, to grow their intelligence and uh, do some, will be good for their, study or some other things. So I think there's a lot of things we can do together. Like this most important thing is the mind, the awareness, the consciousness for ourselves, draw them inward and for everyone we work together. So that's the end, <laughs> not only in two minutes, but I hope I can deliver myself clearly. <laughs>
Thank you, Zhang Yan. And yes, thank you for drawing on all of those different examples. Um, it's very clear. I mean, this is a, a very big area of study. Um, and I'm very grateful to, to Zhang Yan, who first introduced uh, Qigong you know, to, to me and to our university here. And from those small beginnings, um, we have continued to, to do so much more. Uh, our group has grown, the different forms of exercise that we've been exploring, and the feedback I get regularly through emails is, uh, is that people find a lot of benefit. So I think, you know, the point that John was making earlier, what are the benefits to people? I think th that is obviously at the heart of, of the practice. Um, I think it is time to wrap things up. I'm, I'm ever so grateful for everybody who's participated, whether you've just been sitting here listening, and I hope uh, enjoying and getting a lot out of the talks, but also to the, to the different contributors um, you know, who have given their talks, shared their experience, shared their knowledge. It's a fantastic thing to be able to do that. Um, and I hope that we can keep this very lovely community feel, continue to be in touch with each other, and we will um, try to generate more opportunities for us to share. I can see people have shared their email addresses. Please do feel free. And even if after the event, um, you've forgotten who you want to contact or what their contacts are, do get in touch with me. Hopefully everybody's got my email um, and I will make sure that everybody is put in touch. So a very big thank you. Before everybody disappears, could I ask for everybody to turn their cameras on? And I'm gonna do a screenshot because I think that would just be very nice to see um, everybody here, if that's okay. So um, I am now gonna press the buttons, I hope. No, I'm not, I'm doing the wrong thing here. Here we go. So here we are. A screenshot and one more on page two. There we go. Thank you, everybody. It's been lovely meeting and take care and enjoy your Qigong exercise. Thank you. Thank you to everyone. <laughs> Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.